You're listening to The Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to The Struck Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to have a little bit of a different format, kind of do a Q&A dialogue with Alan uh, about the state of aerospace engineering and engineering in general, talk about jobs and education and some of the different skills that are really important, especially now in 2020 as you know, the landscape is changing and communication uh, digitally and in, and in person rapidly changing. Um, and so we'll kind of dive into that today. So Alan, let's start. Um, you know, you have just recently hired a new uh, engineer mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. team. So let's start with some of the skills that you value today and then we'll kind of double back um, through, you know, your education and some of those skills that are maybe more valuable when you were younger and, a you know, a young blood engineer, but yeah. let's, let's talk about your, your new hire and some of the things that you were looking for in an employee. It is unique in the aerospace world, uh, when you're tr- trying to bring somebody new on and we, we are constantly looking for the best engineers we can find. And so when we we, we come across one, we, we tend to grab them. And what, and what do I mean by uh, really good engineers? What I mean by that is they have a couple of different skill sets, uh, uh, what Scott Adams would call a talent stack. So I don't want to s- steal that term, but it's a talent mm-hmm. stack. And that talent stack is uh, things that are developed uh, usually outside the office place uh, and or the office environment. Uh, f- from what I've seen, uh, it's a combination of one being able to work with others to play well in the, on the playground, right? And that that you, that you can relate to others to have uh, you know have a little bit of fun, but also be serious at the same time and, and uh, negotiate, right? I think part of it's just a negotiation. Engineering is a lot of negotiation a lot of times. And being able to do that, and on top of actually having some engineering skills, having the the book knowledge that you need to have an engineering degree, and to do it well, on on top of having the ability to turn a wrench and to understand what it means to turn a wrench, or have not be willing uh, be willing to get your hands dirty if needed, um, those those skill sets really combine into what I always feel is a very useful, versatile engineering person let, let me run with one of those mm-hmm. for a second so we've talked about boeing a lot on the show yeah. and in the past boeing did a lot more of their manufacturing in-house right? right they they produced much more of the entire aircraft themselves now spirit air systems those you know huge sections of the fuselage sure. and 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 with airbus also not just boeing you know you're essentially getting huge pieces coming together to be assembled yeah. So I can imagine that if you're uh, an engineer for Boeing and now you've got to work with engineers from Spirit and everything has got to be kosher, everything has got to fit snugly right. together with these incredible tolerances, right. that's where it seems like it, you can't just be the engineer. Because I know engineers have, you know, my dad's an yep. engineer. Um, they have the reputation sometimes of being, you know, just they're at their desk and they're really good at what they do, but <laughs> don't talk to them, right? That's sometimes the impression yeah. Probably not yeah. fair, certainly in, mo- in, in many cases, right. but um, it seems like there's probably more collaboration than ever with companies starting to outsource some yeah. of and use more vendors and suppliers. Is that true? It, it is. It it does force the, the tier one companies, the Boeings, the Airbuses of the world to be, in some cases, almost seen as a spec writer. You're defining the operation of a system, but the implementation of it happens down at a supplier and it it does sort of take you away from the hardware a little bit, but it does put you closer to the certification work. So it's a different sort of skill set there. Um, it, it does, it has changed it quite a bit. I would say it's changed quite a bit in the last mm, 40-ish years, maybe 50 years in terms of the engineers that were coming out of school, um, tend to get th- thrown on the assembly line for a while, either or as a draftsman. So they were doing a lot of drafting work, and then that was translated into doing some assembly work, working with the manufacturing floor, to then, once you get through this little apprentice stage, then you were sort of brought up into the 
uh, world of quote unquote engineering, where you're doing some analysis work and design work, those that th there was a mm -hmm. normal progression in that. In fact, when uh, my wife and I both started work at General Electric years ago, that's exactly how they designed it. They designed a system where you would work in manufacturing for roughly six months. You're working in design for six months. You're working in program management for six months. So you, you go through this sort of rotational program, uh, similar to what. Amazon is doing with their uh, Blue Origin rocket ship program. It's got the same sort of program set up because you just don't know. You don't know what all that stuff is. You don't know how how somebody manufactures anything until you actually do it. And for some engineers, they never have that opportunity. They're just immediately brought into analysis, design, spec writing, and they're not hardware people. It's a big divide. It is a big divide. If if you don't understand how the the parts are built or, or what the what the constraints are in in a particular design to make to turn a paper drawing or computer drawing into reality, you're missing a whole lot about the process and missing a fun part of the process. So uh, you, you definitely starting to see that dichotomy happen where you you don't necessarily get the experience on the manufacturing floor or, or drafting, making drawings. You just, you just don't have that. It either is you're in analysis or you're a manufacturing engineer and never the two shall cross. Both are good. You need both. I mean, you really do t mm -hmm. to be effective. You just do. Well, and obviously I'm not an engineer, uh, but when you're drawing all these things and you're making them in, whether it's computer automated design mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, software system, of course, back in the day, I'm sure there was a lot of yeah. paper. Um, but you're obviously drawing things that exist in real life. So you're putting in a spec sheet or in a drawing, a bolt that exists in real life. I mean, how much do you have to have familiarity with that specific bolt? Like for you with your radome designs, you're constantly talking about, it has to be a, you know, a, a quarter inch bolt. It's gotta be a number, number four. It's right. gotta be this, it's gotta right. be that. I mean, how, how often do you have to hold those in your hands to really know what you're drawing up? I, I think it helps a tremendous amount to know those things and I always, the the engineers that have worked previously outside of aerospace are, are, can be really useful in that. So if you've designed construction equipment or you've been in the automotive world or you've been in the tractor world or farm equipment world, which is sort of the area of the world that I come from, if you have those little skill sets, you know what a quarter inch bolt is, you know what a half inch bolt is, you know what its yield is, how much strength it has, and there's different qualities of bolts that you can buy. Those are really useful skills mm -hmm. if you're designing something in which the bolt matters, right? Uh, and cost matters also. You can use a cheaper bolt in some cases, right? The, all those little nuances that come to engineering are big in terms of being a su successful company. If I buy the wrong bolt and the thing breaks, I'm in trouble. If I buy a bolt that's way too expensive and it costs too much to produce, I'm in trouble, right? So you, it's hard to conceive of the all the little trade-offs that happen at such a, a micro level every day, but they dramatically change the bottom line. And I think watching, it's, it's gonna be curious to watch here uh, with the electric vertical takeoff and landing companies that are spooling up because they seem to be wanting to spool up people and are trying to hire people that are like senior people. And at least mm -hmm. at least that's what they're advertising right now. So if you go on LinkedIn, you see all these ads for the most senior person in, in the world that knows how to do this one particular thing. That's great. And you, you need those people, but you also need those people that are very skilled, but maybe not as have as much experience uh, that are in that learning process a little bit still. Because they're the ones that can really make or break you. The the the, the people leading the, the the charge are are very important. Like we got to go in this direction on this particular kind of design. But the the implementation happens way down here at a much lower level, and you can really make or break your company at those lower level decisions because they accumulate over time. <laughs> and that's what your final product mm -hmm. is is the accumulation of these little decisions that are happening at such a micro level that the management never sees it. You just don't see it. All they see is a dollar sign and a and a time to build at the end. Well, those decisions were made months ago <laughs> by mm -hmm. someone who may or may not have the the adequate skill set to do it. And that's yeah. that. It, so it's just, it's fascinating in this engineering discussion of there there are a lot of engineers who have those particular skill sets. I don't see them going for to work at these electrical electric vehicle companies. 
which is odd uh, because you need them. You really desperately need them. There are there are a lot of people that have those skill sets that you wouldn't think of that will make a dramatic impact on the performance of an aircraft. Um, that unless you have them in house, you don't realize how valuable they are. And unless you've done this before, you don't really realize it. So, I, I, you know, from an engineering standpoint, if I'm if I'm coming into a new place, a uh, new engineer, uh, uh, say I'm coming into a new aircraft company I haven't ever been in before. Uh, what am I looking for to see if these this company is really going to get to the finish line? I'm looking for bright, smart people at the top is in terms of group leaders, but I'm also looking for that that talent stack. Those those people that really understand some hardware, have some experience, in maybe another industry, uh, but have been in aerospace maybe a, maybe at least a year or two typically, that uh, that can quickly pick up a skill set and move with it. That's what you're looking for, because <laughs> you're going to get thrust in all mm -hmm. kinds of different situations. It'd be like um, as a school teacher, and I'm not sure that the analogy is exact, but in a school teacher situation, you have to be able to teach math and gym. Right? <laughs> yeah, you have to do both of mm -hmm. those. In, a, in an engineering world, you have to be able to design a piece of equipment and explain how it gets assembled to the person on the on the floor. That skill set something gets overlooked. Like if you can't explain to the person who's actually assembling the part, how it's supposed to go together, then I'm not sure what use you, you are to this company because the person that's going to make us a dollar is the person on the floor assembling the, the part. If they can't do that, then what are we doing? And that's, that's where yeah. th those little, those little subtle skill sets like communication really play into it. Well, I want to double back to that, but I also want to go with something that I heard uh, in a recent EVTOL podcast uh, by aviation week where they're talking about this whole space and how, you know, there's a lot of companies that are not going to make it to the right. finish line. And there's a lot of companies that have designs that are just probably not going to come to fruition that are just maybe, you know, like, hey, this is what we've got. But yeah. outsiders are like, that's not going to work. And the the comment that I like your take on was one of the, uh, the, the members in, the, in this in this episode said, well, you know, when you're paid well enough, sometimes you're essentially paid to be insulated from outside opinions to essentially look past the fact that this might not work that if you're paid well enough you'll say we're going to keep going even though maybe this you know we need some dissent in the mm -hmm. team i mean is that a regular thing you've been on a lot of different aircraft projects and, and i'm sure outsiders could be like that project's doomed it's not going to work that design is not yeah. good but yet everyone on the team really smart people really good engineers are still chugging away and it's like how do they not know that this might not work how do they not see these glaring problems can you be paid well enough to to essentially miss or overlook or look past problems like yes. that? Is that a, a thing sure it is and I, i've always felt like the more that an engineer had kids and a spouse the more likely they are to overlook it and keep you need to keep the bus running, right? You got to keep things moving forward. You got to yeah. keep collecting mm -hmm. paychecks to, to pay for the mortgage and the schools and everything else that's going on. And um, the, the the ones that seem to have the, the least vested are the ones that tend to be the most critical. And I, I always took that with a grain of salt because you get the, the new person into an aircraft company that doesn't have a spouse or kids and... Um, has a maybe has a good set of skill sets and they can be super critical right they can be super critical like this is the dumbest way to assemble an aircraft which you hear a lot and it probably maybe is not the best way to assemble an aircraft but it's a way to assemble an aircraft that makes money and and we're doing it so you know maybe you take that with a grain of salt everything's difficult you gotta make a lot of tough decisions you may not make all the right decisions you may not, may not be able to make the decision you want to make but um, if the company's profitable at the end of the day, then they're doing something right. Because it's a very, very, very difficult industry to be in to start off with, as we've seen from the multiple fares of aircraft mm -hmm. companies. It's hard. And I, 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 I do think uh, there are times I've seen in my career where you know, clearly if you're all sitting around the, the, the water cooler and you're really talking about, are we going to be able to make this airplane a reality? I'll, I'll, uh, most engineers are right on point. I'm like this is going to be very difficult, or there's no chance, or 
or you know they have a pretty good sense of it they see it they see how fast it's progressing they see the difficulties they had they're, they're pretty observant but whether they can bring themselves to yeah you know to acknowledge it in front of management is a different thing Yeah, and it, it brings to mind um, an example that I have with this. So I uh, I, I met a, a person who was on like the content team for this Upstart Sports League, mm. which still it still exists. It's like two years old now. And, you know, me having a, a pro baseball background, this league was like women's softball and, and a couple other women's mm. sports. And it was a really unique um business model where they were changing some of the rules it was kind of complicated to understand like why this league was different and uh we were talking about some of their strategies and some of my skills where it overlapped and she was like well would you maybe be interested in consulting with us and none of this came to fruition but as i was thinking about like playing it out of my head i'm like all right i go i go there and i give this presentation really what i thought was this is going to be a huge failure. I don't believe in this at all. Like I, I played ball long enough to know that I just don't think this is a good idea and I don't think it's going right. to work. I don't think the market's there. I think it's a complicated idea basically. And so my, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, what if they paid me X amount of dollars? Do I go in and say, Hey, here's 11 reasons why this is a, a, a ship destined to sink like <laughs> no you don't do that because they're paying you not to do that but like what if that's really really the opinion is it does anyone want to hear that yeah. um obviously that's not what they're paying mm. for they're paying for how to get there yeah to get it to get it going but in the back of my mind it's like yeah i guess i guess they probably could have paid me enough where i could have just like given them my best effort while still knowing in the back of my mind that i don't i don't believe this is going to work at all mm which I still don't. I, I don't, of course, wish this company any ill oh, will, no. but I've seen a lot of sports leagues, including teams that I played for, fold financially. Yeah. I know how That's hard right. it is, just like you know how hard it is to make an airplane. Yeah. I know how hard it is to support a minor league baseball yeah. team. <laughs> and then we're talking about other, you know, again. So, but neither here nor there, but um, but yeah, so I have a little experience with it. It yeah. is similar, it's very similar. So, so you have a lot of companies out there like that now, um, I mean, does any of the management, do they know that? Are they looking for people who are just bright and eyed and bushy tailed and like, hey, let's let's give it our, I mean, do you have to have a certain personality to take on one of these aircraft? Like you were on the Horizon project, which ended up, um, or um, you have a lot of familiarity with that project. Yeah, and Eclipse, yeah, Eclipse. And I've done a lot of different aircraft programs, some that have been successful, some not. Uh, has there been a big differentiator mm -hmm. between the two? Cash will change everything. Uh, having enough money to to get over some of the technical hurdles is huge. Um, and also, if you think about it, and this is a hard thing for engineers to think about, but the marketplace, like who's going to buy this thing? What are they looking for? Uh, engineers get pulled away from the customer stuff quite a bit in aerospace. I say they're much closer to it in mm -hmm. a lot of other industries. Uh, haven't worked in a lot of other industries, but uh, the customer is so far removed from the aerospace engineer, typically, that you have a hard time relating to what features they will pay for and what they're not going to pay for. Yeah. <laughs> right? It, it, it's, it's hard to um, put a value on that sometimes because you're just like with the sports leagues, right? You, you have to know, you know, the, the, the reason a sports league exists or doesn't exist comes down to the customer. What does the customer want? Yeah, who's, who's watching it? Right. Are they going willing to mm -hmm. pay for it? And how much are they willing to pay for it? And how often are they willing to pay for it? Uh, that same thing exists in aerospace, right? And how many airplanes are you possibly going to sell? And are they going to buy a second one or a third one? Or is it, or is it it's just a one-off purchase and they're done forever? Uh, who knows, right? And it does make a difference on the way you design the aircraft of how much emphasis you put in. I'll give you a good example. Uh, how much emphasis do you put on the interior of an aircraft? Does it really sell an aircraft? Like, do you have an upgraded interior? Does it make a sale? I think in general, the answer is yes. It totally makes a sale. Whether the aircraft has a lavatory in it or not can make a sale. Uh, stuff that if you're designing the wing of the airplane, you would, wouldn't even care less about. But the person that's buying yeah. the aircraft cares a lot about that. 
and those things kind of get tossed. The people that do the lavatories and airplanes are, are somewhat seen as second-class citizens in a sense in the engineering world because they're not designing the aerodynamics of the airplane. But I swear to mm -hmm. I swear to you, more airplanes are sold on the interiors and the amenities on the inside of the aircraft than the, than how far they fly, and 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 yet that's not where the emphasis lies. <laughs> yeah. Well, in restaurants, you see the same yeah. thing. I mean, how many people, you know, women especially, who have to, you know, us men, the only difference is we don't have to sit down, right, a lot of times. Um, bathroom cleanliness is a huge yeah. thing. So if you go to a restaurant and they have a disgusting bathroom, do you, does your wife want to go back there? Probably not, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's that's a huge, a huge right. thing. And we've also talked about the Solera 500L yeah. and the blimp, awkward shape of it. And, you know, some YouTube comments of the show were like, who cares? You know, if it flies, <laughs> no one cares. But to your point, you think it does matter yeah. because ultimately it has to you have to sell the aircraft, yeah. um, especially in contrast or in, in contrast with, uh, you know, something like the Honda jet, which I know you think and I agree is a, a really beautiful looking yeah, jet and also very efficient, even if it's not as efficient as the Solera 500L. Right. It's a it's a handsome looking aircraft, right? That's something that you'd be proud to hang your hat on, no matter who you are. Right, right, right. And and yet it seems to get poo pooed quite a bit in terms of aircraft sales. And I, and I know there's there's always it's just like in car sales, right? There's always the person that's looking for the most economical car, and there's also a person looking for the fastest car, and there's also a person looking for the most most luxurious car. What is your clientele? Who are these people, and what are they likely to buy? And what are those features that you need to have in there? And and it you can win or lose a sale on an aircraft for very small stuff, uh, especially on the secondary market. It's very hit and miss. And as an engineer, I think that we get removed from that a lot of times. That and that's a struggle. And I, I always wonder if these eVTL companies are in tune with that in a sense of what does that customer experience look like and who's driving that and how does that translate down to the engineering at all? Does it? Does it even get to, does it even translate down? I know in a lot of aircraft companies I've been around, it's translated in the sense of this. Uh, we gotta have this, it can't be more than this amount of weight and it's gotta go this fast. After that, you're pretty much left up to whatever you need to go do to certify it. <laughs> and, and you're like, wow, okay. There's a lot more detail than that, and it we're always sort of left out of that conversation. And I, yeah, and so and, and, and I guess you know, and how that relates to uh, being a new engineer and coming to the marketplace. One, the the difficulty right now, if you're coming out of school, let's just say you're graduating in spring of 2021, bad timing. But I think there's there is some. Uh, things you can do to increase your chances to, to kind of get in those aerospace roles a little bit. One, obviously have some communication skills. Two, uh, have some hands-on skills, be able to turn a wrench. And three, have those sort of analytical skills and be smart, be, be able to grasp new skills and, and make those things happen. The question is whether the aircraft companies and the aerospace companies ever value that because the way that the hiring mm -hmm. is happening right now is hiring... It's sort of hiring by AI and that you send in a resume and it's looking, scanning all these, your resume and it's looking for these keywords and then it sorts these into little buckets. Here's my advice on that whole nonsense is I, there's a human resource group there for a purpose and they do serve a very valuable purpose and that there's, particularly now, if I'm, if I am Tesla or Amazon or one of these big, cool, hip companies right now, I am probably getting flooded with hundred look probably hundreds of thousands of resumes right now how do i get around that how do i get through that hurdle of stuff contacts I mean, person to person contact is the way to do that and it's been many a times that uh, i if i find a project that i want to work on i'll just go to the head of engineering and send them a note just do and say hey i'm interested in helping you guys out when do you need help and the Here's my resume, and here's my resume. All right, uh, that kind of thing sort of skirts the HR issues and the uh, automated scanning services that happen there. Knowing somebody that works at one of these aircraft companies or aerospace companies is usually huge, and you know, having connection there is big. And I, I think uh, there's so much um, there's so much talent today 
coming out of a lot of really good engineering schools that I don't know if human resources in general knows what those skills are, skill sets are that they need to pull into a new aircraft company. So if I'm if I'm an HR person at one of these eVTOL companies and I haven't built an aircraft before, and I'm an HR person outside of the aerospace community, do I know what talent set I'm looking for right now? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Would you? I wouldn't know. Like if I, if I got thrown into the fashion industry and I said, okay, I need to go hire fashion industry experts to help us design some new um, fashion line. I would have no idea where to start, right? Well, why does that same thing not exist on the aerospace side? Where are you going? Who are you going to grab? I mean, what, what, what key places are you going to go focus on to find talent? And I, I mean, real talent, sort of like baseball, right? Trying to find real mm-hmm. talent is hard. I'll tell you how GE used to do it. And I thought this was a really good way. GE used to have a feedback system where they'd hire engineers from all over. And then they look at how the performance ratings were internal to the company. And they try to correlate performance ratings with schools. And then they would rank those schools on a tier system. So our best performers come out of, let's say it's Harvard, or, or, Says so Purdue. Let's just use Purdue because it's engineering school. So our best performers come out of Purdue. I'm going to hire Purdue engineers as much as I can. In fact, I'm going to pay them a little bit more out of school. But the the engineers coming out of you know uh, Paducah State or something are really good, but they're not as good as Purdue. So I'm going to pay them at a slightly lower tier level to come into to come into GE. So when you went to work for GE at the time, this is back in the 90s. You got paid on where you went to school, not what your resume was. You got paid on where you went to school. It was a very interesting way because you didn't realize at the time when you were hired, you didn't realize that, that was happening to you. First off, <laughs> that your salary was set before you even signed a contract. They knew what they're going to pay you and you could take it or leave it. But you also, over time, you kind of figured out like where they were grabbing talent from because they, they actually had a feedback loop on it. And uh Mm-hmm. The, the, the schools they were grabbing uh, uh, engineers from wouldn't have been in necessarily in U.S. News and World Report in the top 10. Fascinating, right? Yeah. Fascinating. Well, and that, that also has parallels with the sports world. It I does. Mean, like in, especially in, base, in baseball, the Major League Baseball draft is a, is a crapshoot, right? right? Even <laughs> of the, the first round, which these are all guys who are getting a million plus dollars as yep. a signing bonus, the best players in the country only 50% of them even spend one day in the majors. Right. So you say, okay, how do we find players who are actually going to become major leaguers? Um, you know, and you start to see, well, okay, this school has produced 20 major leaguers in the last 10 years. And this school, which wins more games, plays in a better conference, has only produced four. What, what's the divide? And you start to realize, well, the culture there and the coaching staff and some of the things that they're doing that maybe we don't even know what they are, are resulting that these guys can handle the minor leagues and ascend through the ranks and out-compete other players. And you see that at some programs where like Vanderbilt's a good example. And of course they are one of the top programs in the country, but Vanderbilt pumps out major league players, not just draft picks, but like guys make that it. make it to the top, that fight, fight through. And so you're like, well, what what's the X factor that they learn at Vanderbilt? Well, mental toughness, yeah. you know, whether, you know, stick-to-itiveness, whatever yeah. it is, there's a, there's a cocktail of things that are, probably largely intangible that are coming from only that that group <laughs> yeah. that's helping guys fight through the really challenging times in in the minor leagues and i'm sure that's the same thing in yeah. engineering like you talk about how what a grind it yeah, is yeah. when you're you know away from your family and you're just you know burning the the candle at both yeah. ends and it's unclear how you solve a problem that you've never solved before <laughs> that's that same kind yeah. of grind right and i think some schools are probably going to prepare you more for that than others. Yes. Oh, I, I think definitely so. I, I obviously I've been around a number of engineers from an, all all across the world, and you do find these pools of places that we you wouldn't normally expect, um, based on location or a, ver- a variety of other factors that you think, man, I wouldn't have expected that place to have such uh, a very a very talent filled group of engineers that are coming out of there consistently it's 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 not what you expect i think a lot of times it's not what you expect it's not uh necessarily ivy league schools it doesn't tend to be i mean there's obviously are very 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 bright people go to ivy league schools i'm not one of them uh 
but I, I think until you've sort of been in the industry for a while, you don't really see that and see where the the talent comes from. And, and it, I think it's some part uh, what is taught in the classroom. That's a big part of it. But I think it's all those sort of intangibles. Like, yeah, are they getting with hit with hard problems in the classroom? Are they are they able to work on uh, real world things? Are they able to assemble things? Are they getting their hands dirty a little bit? Are they able to go from computer to the real world? Are they are are, are the things they're building competing against somebody else or another college just so they can see where they stack up at those little things do add up over time and they are the intangibles they are totally the intangibles and you're right dan like if i'm on a minor league bus as a baseball player that's that's hard that's hard that's that's just flat old hard living and unless you can tolerate mm -hmm. that part of being in baseball or you can tolerate the fact that you don't yeah yeah you don't get the $10 million payday. You no, just you're, not, you're not eating yeah. well. You're not sleeping well, right? I mean, those kind of come along with it. Uh, it's, the same thing can kind of exist in engineering. I mean, there's been many a nights where it's been, you know, working all through the night and the weekends and all that kind of stuff. And if you're not willing to do at least a little bit of that, you're sort of missing out on the fun part of engineering. But it's also the, all the things you, you learn when that happens. And um, it mm -hmm. does take a certain kind of skill set to do that. It does. Well, so my last question for you is what makes a successful engineer? So like we talk about, you know, a minor leaguer becoming a major yeah. leaguer, but in the engineering world, like engineers are, are very highly sought after they're well paid. Um, but what's the, if you're not a good engineer or you're a lesser engineer than someone else, do you lose your job? I mean, are there starving engineers somewhere <laughs> or do you just not get to work on the best projects. I mean, what does it look like climbing the scale of engineers? Because I, I don't know what that what that looks like. I think there's a wide variety of people and a, and a wide variety of what uh, engineers deem to be fun, successful careers. There, there's a broad spectrum of what that even looks like. Uh, I, I, I'm not, I would say, I, I would say probably the, the biggest skill set, which is probably the most difficult skill set for a lot of engineers is the communication side. You need to be able to write well. And if you can't communicate via writing, and then you're just gonna have a hard time getting anywhere because if someone can't take your input, read it quickly, absorb it, and move on to the next thing, then you just lost them. And that piece of communication is probably the hardest part, probably one of the least taught things in engineering school even today, is the ability to write clearly and communicate technical concepts at a level that a manager who may not be an engineer could grasp. Uh, that that's mm -hmm. a, that's a skill set. But in terms of um, you know how to sort of are there engineers that don't that aren't successful? I, I think that is probably the largest the largest piece over time is the not being able to adequately communicate the concepts and the, the I'm not talking about using flowery language and engineering writing is totally different than reading the Wall Street Journal, right? And, and it's totally different than reading the New York Times or the Washington Post or the San Francisco Chronicle or any of those other things. It is a totally very unique subset of communication that only engineers can understand. Uh, and so you're until you're in it or have done it, it's hard to explain, but it's probably the thing that sets back most engineers from from having uh, very fruitful careers. And then they may be technically geniuses, but if they can't explain it, they're, they're stuck. And, and that's one of the things that happened to me early in, in schooling. I transferred schools halfway through my engineering career, and I got hit in the back of the head, it seems, with a club about writing. And communication skills. And the, the second school I went to, where I finished up at, what made a huge emphasis on writing and being able to communicate. And I came into it cold a little bit because I was essentially into my sophomore, beginning of my junior year, coming in sort of as a transfer student. And all the other students said, I had already had two years of it and I'm coming in and whammo. <laughs> uh, your writing needs to get better. It needs to get clearer. It needs to be more direct. It needs to have a certain flow to it. It needs to be shorter. It needs to have um, more common terms used. and. Until you do that for a while, you don't realize that, yeah, <laughs> everybody else's stuff is, everything else is, everybody else's uh, compositions or technical reports are all way better than mine. Why? 
And that's really helped later on in life, honestly, is that you don't really lose that skill set once you just hone it over time. So when I've gone to, I don't know, I pick, pick a part of the world that I've been in, um, uh, and I've talked to engineers, the, the one thing about finding about the engineers that seem to kind of get to those leadership roles is the ones that can explain themselves and can write. If you can't write, you're in trouble. And I, and, and I think as an engineer coming out of school, and if I'm if I'm hiring somebody, I want to I want to know they can write a little bit. I want to know they can communicate to me because it's not always going to be a presentation form. And I know we're all and Dan, you want to everything's in this PowerPoint, YouTube, Instagram format mm-hmm. today, but that doesn't translate very well. Like that doesn't go into an engineering file for a, a person a year later to pick up. Like I don't, I don't make a YouTube video on how I uh, put this wing on an airplane, right? I have to I have to create. Uh, uh, something that I can pick up a year from now and read and understand quickly and grasp the concepts and implement a year from now. And, and until everybody, everybody has that, I'm just not sure you're ever going to get to the point you want to get to in engineering. And it's sad to say, but it's true. And I've seen a lot of engineers from really, really, really good schools not be able to write. And it's a shame because you know inside that head is a genius that they just can't get it out. Yeah, and as we wrap up, it's um, it's definitely something that is starting younger and younger, where that's that problem is being exacerb- exacerbated because teachers don't want to put red ink yeah. on a kid's paper yeah. for self esteem issues, for other issues. Sometimes it's policy they can't use a red pen. Oh yeah, and a lot of sure. times kids and parents will complain that why did my son get a get a C? Why did my daughter get a B minus on this paper? It should be graded for content, not for grammar and for writing, which I think is utter hogwash. Mm. You know, as a as a philosophy That's major true, myself, right? yeah, it's true. My papers got marked up a lot, <laughs> and I found it. And there's still this one moment from my high school career with a humanities professor who was very influential in my writing. Who I got a paper back. I have no idea what the paper was about, but it was like a you know it was a humanities class. So, and he was an English teacher as well, so he was always a hard grader. My paper was covered. It was like covered in blood. It was just covered in red pen, but I got a B or something, like a B plus. And I'm like, these two don't seem to jive. Like you look at all this red and you're like, I got a, I got an F or an E, which they don't give Fs anymore. Um, but no, I got a good grade, but he just corrected stuff. He's like, this paper was good, but like you're a high school writer. So this is, you know, agreement error, agreement error, agreement error, like all these different things that were just mostly grammatical, helping me be better. And I was like, oh, yeah. okay. I didn't do poorly. I just, these are ways to improve my writing. Right. And even in college, they don't mark up papers. Yeah. They just, they don't, they don't do it very yeah. often. So yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a growing problem. It is. And I think it's funny how the world comes back around <laughs> because for people like me who have a useless degree, I've heard it my whole life. What, what were you going to do with philosophy? I didn't know. But 10 years ago, everyone's saying, oh, the humanities are dead. I think even Barack Obama was talking about how, you know, trades, you know, trade skills are the important way to make your living in the future, which is still valid. But there's a lot of more emphasis on people that can join an organization and think critically and write well and communicate well, which are some of those abstract you know, humanities degrees yeah. or liberal liberal arts degrees. It seems like they're coming back because, again, those skills aren't taught. So some and you know, obviously I'm not going to fill an engineer's role, but my skill set could be used here or there, like, you know, all sorts yeah. of places where we just need someone who can communicate well. <laughs> yeah. And we can teach them how to do the other stuff. Like you said, you, we can teach someone to learn software. Right. But please teach them to write in college. Please, so we can teach them the engineering yeah. stuff. But we need them to know that before they yeah. come here. My my father, um, who recently passed away, uh, was one of the best writers that I've been around, and he got his college degree. He was the last person in my family to have a college degree, so he learned, I think, how to write by reading. And pr- trying to pick up that skill set on learning how to write. I mean, that, that's something that it, it, it can happen in college, but it can obviously happen outside of college too. And it's a it's a skill set that can be learned over time. It takes a little, obviously, it takes practice, like everything does. But in terms of uh, putting together, and, and what my father would describe as, you have to tell a story. And I, and as an engineer, you're like, huh? Like I'm just trying to explain how to put this bolt into this part. 
right? It's not that complicated. Well, if you tell it in a story format, it makes it a lot easier for other people to read and understand. And he was right. He's totally right on that. Uh, and if if reading things that he put together, and I, I would I would send um, such a stuff for the company to him all the time to review and to look at, and it would come back all red. And it's like, hey, you know, tell the story. Tell explain how what's happening. It's not. I know all this stuff is technical and you're doing really cool stuff, but you still have to explain it in terms that people can understand and you have to put it in a format that people are used to seeing. And this, the story format for me was always the hardest thing to get through because you just want to get to the answer like, hey, I, got, I found this cool answer. Look, look how well this thing does. Yeah, but no one gets that far because you're not telling in a story format. And I, I've always felt like that was a huge advantage to know that up front, like let's explain things in a story form. And as engineers, that's one of the skill sets you just don't have. You know, it, it doesn't come natural to you because it's all about the cool thing. <laughs> it always is. But the story is huge. And as a, as a skill set, as one of those skill set you, that I think engineers need to acquire, hopefully earlier rather than later, is to be able to write and tell things in a story format. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Obviously a little bit different than our usual format, but we wanted to kind of go off script, talk a little bit about the uh, the engineering world today. So if you're new here, thanks for listening or watching. Be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen. Share it with a friend, and we'll catch you here next week on The Struck Podcast. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardarrow.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.